Hello, I'm Dr. Lisa Belial, and you are listening to or watching Radio Maine. Today I have with me artist Rodney Dennis. Thanks so much for coming in today. Thank you. You made a kind of a commitment to come be part of our show. I feel very honored. Oh, I appreciate that. Um, it was an, the honor is ours to be here, to be uh, for you all to consider as far as representing us. And uh, so um, that and part of the contract, yeah, I decided to come here. <laughs> I mean, you traveled from Washington, D.C., correct? Yeah. Yeah. And how did you find your journey? Um. It was, yeah, it was a flight. I guess I was used to flying so much that, uh, that uh, yeah, we jumped on the flight. We worked it out in our schedule, and uh, we were able to get here. So, uh, yeah, we didn't want to miss the opportunity. Well, thank you. Yeah. You haven't been with the art gallery for very long. No, I, I guess not. We just we just signed on um, within the past several weeks. Uh, yeah, officially in the past several weeks, and, uh, and uh, excited about the opportunities. And that you all present, and um, as well as the um, the opportunities for exposure specifically for actual artists. So uh, we were impressed. So we thought we'd give it a good look. One of the reasons that I think we became interested in you is that uh, your classmate Missy Dunaway is also one of our artists, and, yeah. and she said you really need to take a good look at this artist. He's very talented. I paid Missy a lot of money. Yeah, you say that. well, that's good, <laughs> <laughs> Missy. I won't ask you about that the next time I see you, but whatever it took, we're glad to Missy have was you bright. here. No, she wasn't bright. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so you both, you attend school together and uh, mm -hmm. here in New England. And it's, again, it's a school that you have to make a commitment to attend. Absolutely. Absolutely. We, uh, we met there. And, um, and yes, it is a very rigorous course. Anything regarding academic studies or the atelier methodologies that um, the uh, our earlier artists actually follow, um, very very rigorous, very, you, know, you have to be committed to it. Yeah. Tell me about um, the atelier approach. Oh, jeez. It's uh, such as an academic approach and inform involves, um, gosh, I, I wish I had my cheat sheet in front of me, um, but basically it involves a lot of the actual studies and understanding of uh, approaching the, the form and doing it in a representational manner. So um, the curriculum is um, pretty standard. I don't say standard, but just covers different aspects of that in order to get to a certain level. From what I understand, it's, uh, the standards are actually quite high. They have a lot of expectations of you. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's, yeah, I would say the standards are high as far as for academic because it, uh, the process is... Um, it, it weeds out a lot of people. So um, I think commitment is a good word to use. The type of work that you do is considered realist painting? Representational. Representational. Yeah. So you have two different aspects, abstract and representational. So within that, that's when you branch off. Um, case in point, like you can have someone who could be, a, you know, as someone who's a physician, they could be a cardiologist or someone who's a foot doctor or things of that nature. So there are different areas. So um, hyperrealism, straight realism, representationalism, or, or, uh, or surrealism. So. Well, one of the things I really enjoy about these conversations is that I get to learn a lot because obviously my, my field is medicine. So I've gone deeply into that field. But I, I'm kind of going to pick your brain a little bit. Have mm. you have you expand upon this for those of us who haven't had the opportunity to do all well, the training that you I, do? I, I tell you what, I don't know how much picking you'd be able to get, but I'll give you what I got. Huh? Good. All right. So if you are doing representational art, what does that mean to the, the person walking around a museum seeing a piece that you have created? You know, um, I, I have to say this is that, I mean, your question is, what, was, what does it mean to someone walking around? Um, because a lot of this comes down to perception and really what it is that we've already been, I guess, pre-programmed or understand what art is and not really being versed in representationalism or abstractism. Um, if anything, we're more so versed in expressionism. 
So, what, what's the difference between abstractism, expressionism, um, realism? Jeez, I did not bring the curriculum with me for my uh, actual graduate studies. Well, what but. Would, <laughs> that's okay. Uh, all right. But what would what would a piece of art look like if it was one of those things? And again, that goes down to the perception of the in- individual. Because uh, someone may look at this, this particular piece and say, oh, that looks like a photograph. But they may not even understand anything about representationalism. It's not something that's generally taught. Well, tell me about this piece. How, well, what's the name of this piece, and how would you describe it? Gosh. Uh, <laughs> I was, while she was musing. While she was musing. This particular piece is, um, is basically a devotional piece. This is an individual who is captured in a time where you're really not really seeing someone, someone who's actually, I don't want to say solace, but someone who's actually, um, how they start out their day are really what makes them who they are. Um, one of the elements that she's holding is, um, is a book entitled The Purpose Driven Life. And um, she's on a faith journey. So there's a, yeah, that's one aspect of it that's pretty much the, uh, one of the, I don't want to say the competing aspects, but that's one of the main aspects. The other aspect is a woman of color that you don't necessarily see in this kind of way. So um, highlighting, exposing, presenting a different view. How are women of color usually represented in art? I think the first thing that comes to, I, well, how are they represented in art? There really aren't that many represented in representational art, to be honest with you, throughout the ages. You don't really see a person of color. So I'm, let's just take the art part off of and just say, well, how are women of color being viewed, period? So I guess it's like today, they're really not in a very, much, very positive air fashion. It sounds like the, the narrative when it comes to art is very important to you. Oh, well, yeah, narrative is important. It is. Um, I would dare to say it is. But, you know, narrative can mean a lot of things. What does it mean to you? Narrative. <laughs> Just narrative. Yeah, I, narrative is, is basically, what is it that you're trying to say? Or really, what is this, you know, what is the story? Yeah, to me. So, I believe that, yeah. You should have a story with it. That's what I believe. So in this in this case, the the faith journey is the it sounds like is the story. She's on a faith journey, but that's not the narrative of the series. Yeah. Expand upon that. The, yeah. <laughs> I expand upon which part of it. Um, um. Well, on the what's the narrative of the series then? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um. An actual area, just basically how women of color, how they are, how the, the innocence, to expose the innocence part, not something that has been pretty much pervasive in today's media. So this is what's really capturing that, or really that was the effort to capture that. She's adorned in white. She's not, quote, unquote, opulent or, or anything that's, anything that's, um, Anything that's focused just on the esoterics, but just um, adorning white, very simplified, but yet very gentle, very, very innocent. And so that you have just walked into, into an area that she, uh, you weren't invited in, but she just happens to notice that you were there. So that's pretty much the undergirding of a lot of this, of this particular series, yeah. Do you think that this is limited to women of color? Do you think men of color are represented in art? Neither. Yeah. Yeah. Not in representationalism. Abstractism, yeah. But not in representationalism. Yeah. And then it goes back to as far as, well, what's the difference between abstractism and representationalism? But as far as actually uh, the representation of... Uh, of people of color in the um, in the arts of actually uh, what you actually are viewing, no. You've been doing art for a very long time. You started when you were quite young. Mm-hmm. 
did you have people in your life who suggested that you do art or supported you in your in your art? Gosh, I tell you, I tell you what, that's a. Did I have people who? I'm trying to understand your question more so. Well, let's just say in your family. Did your family see that you were interested in art and try to find ways so that you could engage in it from no, an early age? Not at all. Not at all. This, uh, it's not something that's very, uh, um, in my particular family, it's not something that um, uh, they were more concerned about how I was, how I was going to make a living. Yeah. So um, they did see something very special. So, um, but no, no, they didn't really understand it. So if you're in a family that doesn't really understand your art, but it's something that you feel strongly about, how did you find it within yourself to keep moving forward? At the age of five? Yeah. I wouldn't even understand the question you asked me. <laughs> you just knew you liked it and you knew you were going to do it and... I don't know. I really don't know, really. I mean, I mean, at that age, I just don't really think that it's that formulaic. To be honest with you, I just think that it's just, hey... It's something that um, that I liked that I did. I really wasn't thinking about it as far as whether or not I liked it or or whether or not um, I got support for it or whatnot. It was just something I did. So you so around the age of five, did you continue to seek art instruction while you were going up through school? Did I seek it? Yeah. At the age of five. <laughs> oh, I guess I mean, you know. <laughs> I've talked to some artists who's, who went to high schools where there was a strong art program and they had mentorship and they had instruction at their high schools. And so I guess I'm not talking age of five now. I'm talking kind of fast forward a little bit. Yeah, um, you know, what? I, I guess um, I think for in, in the realm as far as, you know, Washington, D.C., as far as community, um, as far as being a you know, person of color and that would, you know, in my mind, it would say opportunity. I don't think we had those kind of opportunities growing up. And I say we, as far as my generation or who I grew up with, um, they were very limited. It's uh, for someone to come along and invest. Yeah, that kind of way. So did I seek it? I didn't even know what to seek. Um, a lot of good things happened. Um, when people recognized what was in front of them. Um, but um, and me personally. I, I didn't know what's. I just basically just whatever I could get my hands on in order to do what I wanted to do as far as art was. From what I can remember. <laughs> it was a long time ago. Yeah, okay. Well, thanks, Lisa. Yeah, that, I, <laughs> that's true. I guess uh, it, five was a long time ago for me, too. So, yeah. yeah <laughs> I, I gotcha. I gotcha. So w when you finished your, let's say, under your high school education and you decided to move forward with art training and art education, what were some of the things that you were considering when choosing the path to take? You know, um, I think what were the things I was considering? It Again, I just, yeah, I really think good. Yeah, I really am thankful for the advisements, um, those individuals who came along and who, um, who saw, or rather who had experience, or who had the education, or who could direct me. Um, so I think that was really what was the, uh, the driving force. People call it luck, people call it Oregon, something else or whatnot. But there were some people who just came along and just said, hey, listen, you know, let's go and take a look at this, or Here, here's some other options, and open up a breadth of uh, other opportunities. And you currently have another job that you do. So you're, you have your job mm -hmm. that, I guess, supports you. So I'm sure your family's happy that you have that, given that that was a well, it, it, early it, prerequisite, I guess. Uh, well, yeah. Is it my family, my immediate family? or uh, You know, when you were suggesting th that maybe there wasn't as much support for the art piece because they wanted to make sure you could... Uh, you know, yeah. make make a living, but you and you currently do that. You have a whole other life, yeah. a whole other job outside yeah, of art. Yeah, we're, we're, I'm not on skid row, but I'm, yeah, it's going well. <laughs> so you have that, and then in a parallel life, you also have the art. Yeah, pushing into the art. 
Yeah. And how do the two things intersect or maybe not intersect? I don't intersect. You know, um, you know, Lisa, to that piece right here on the wall took 256 hours to do. That had to be scheduled and in conjunction with working a full-time job and the other responsibilities and, uh, and also trying to get sleep. So, um, so we were averaging, I was averaging roughly about 25 hours every week in addition to a 45 hour work week. So, um, I don't know what, I don't know. I, I, I don't, I wouldn't call it an intersection. I would call it just more so a determination and make some choices and, uh, sacrifices in order to do something that, um, I don't say that you want to, but something that you believe. Something you have to believe in. You're an early riser. Four, what, is that, what does that mean? Oh. 4 a.m.? 4 a.m. I mean, to most people, that's an early riser, I would think. <laughs> yeah. Do you do uh, any of your art before you try to get into work, or where do you schedule that? 4 a.m.? You know, I'm too busy trying to go ahead and try to take care of Rod, so I try to get some exercise in. And, um, you know, and then, um, but no, not in the morning time to do that because I usually have to uh, clock in or log in at 6.30 a.m. For your job? For my job. What job do you do that causes you <laughs> to need to do that at 6.30 a.m.? Work for the U.S. federal, yeah, you know, I used to work for the federal government. And, uh, and that was, uh, that's part of what I, what I do. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so I work a pretty full day. So where do you fit all of these hours? Um, so I get up, I do a compressed schedule. This is the secret. So get up and log in at 6.30, I do four 10-hour days. That sometimes, or rather 10 to 12-hour days. That's Monday through Thursday, and then Friday and Saturday. That's when I get up and paint. Access between 10 to 13 hours a day, and then another six hours or four to four hours on Sunday. And do it all over again. So that doesn't seem to leave a lot of time for things like sleep. One of the reasons why I get up so early. <laughs> but then you also travel from Washington, D.C. up to Boston, I believe, for oh, your education. And I was in the absolutely in school, so I would catch a pl- catch a flight. Yeah. Thursday morning, uh six AM flight, and then uh go to a remote site, log in on that Thursday, and then leave a few hours earlier by actually taking some leave and then go to go to class. And then go to class again all day Friday, and then go to class again majority of Saturday and then fly back to Washington, D.C. I mean, that's incredible dedication. Yes, you got to believe in it. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, back to your question, but as far as the intersecting piece, I never looked at it like that. Yeah. <laughs> so you have your job that enables you to, to make a living. And then you have the art, which yeah. is how you make a life. Oh, hopefully the art will help me to make a living. It's something I like to do. Yeah. I guess it's, yeah. If that's what you're asking, how do I view the art uh, path? Is that what you're asking? Well, I mean, I think you're bringing up something that's very real, that in the end, you're. I assume that at some point you'll stop working the federal government job and move more fully into the art as your formal yeah, well, hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. But hey, it still has to be supported. Yeah, you know, one way, shape, or form. You and I are not that dissimilar, really. And you were asking me this question before because yeah. I also have my other, my job, my real yeah. job, which doesn't really have a lot of intersection with what I do here. And I also feel really strongly about the work that I do here. And so for me, it is the the fact that it it is something that resonates with me so deeply that keeps me 
kind of pushing through and, and having this parallel um, existence, I guess. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, it's funny because you said they, they, it's almost like they both don't relate. Yeah. What I do um, professionally, or rather for, the, for work and what I do here, they're basically the core. They basically, to me, they're the same thing. It's In just, what way? <sighs> communication. Yeah. Um, I think I wrote down one of the, um, one of the answers there, um, regarding as far as I, I think I mentioned it, mentioned it at the beginning of there, but as far as uh, communication and, um, and it ties back into as far as, you know, or rather that you were asking, uh, I can't remember which question it was, but when I said they, uh, you were like the differences between abstractism and, and, um, representationalism. But, you know, the thing about it is this is that I believe that it's a responsibility because image making is a responsibility. And but for any interpersonal dynamic, that is a responsibility. That's not just a right. So this is something that I mean, so and I appreciate as far as the compliment you made. You said, well, I see a lot of detail and this is a beautiful piece. But my objective, or rather the whole objective is, what is it that communicates, whether or not you connect with it, and whether or not it meets an objective. I mean, all communication has to meet an objective, as opposed to just talking to someone, or talking at someone, or I just have something to say, whether or not you're listening or not. Yeah. And... And to be fair, also, I feel the same way about the work that I do, that, that the core to both of the things that I do in my life really is communication. Yeah. So. Yeah, I know I don't have any, I know this is an interview for me, but I'd love to ask you that question. I'm like, oh, really, Lisa, tell me more. <laughs> I mean, because like, you know, as a physician and then you're, you know, you're, you're a phenomenal interviewer. Um, yeah. I'm just like, yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, it's almost like, you know, a faith and practice kind of thing. It was like, you know, really, what is it that, you know, the why? And then you have as far as, okay, the implementation thereof. So I was like, you know, what's, you know, really, how's the intersecting there? Um, but yeah, uh, a lot of times uh, in my experience as far as art, oh, I just felt like doing this. Or, I you know, this is something that, in, you know, has inspired me to do this. Or I'm passionate about it, which I'm like going... Well, you can be passionate about just chewing gum. I'm just saying is that, you know, there are things, you know, but do you believe in it? And why do you do? Is this something that drives you? Not just so you can just get it out, but how does it affect other people? And I think that's a responsibility. When people see your art, do they share with you what it brings up for them? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's funny. I'm, I'm, I'm in answering your your question specifically. No, it doesn't. What it brings up for them? Yeah, it really depends on you know what lens they're looking at it through. You know. Well, one of the things that when I've spoken to other people who create art. Um, that they enjoy, and I'm thinking of a conversation with Anne, Anne Trainer Deming about her art, and she doesn't put forth. She puts forth the art, and then she waits for how people uh, respond to it themselves, because she doesn't want to dictate what it is that they see or interpret necessarily. But then I think she's also kind of intrigued as to what kind of story that creates for them. Hmm. It's interesting. Yeah. I, I just when you were just saying that, I'm here going, geez, yeah, every aspect, every stroke is calculated for a reason. The pl there's planning, there's strategy that goes into all of this. So I, I guess to me, I mean, for me, I, what is it I'm trying to achieve? What is it, the objective in the communication? Uh, there's, a, there's a study that, go, uh, um, research that says that a perception is is made a person makes a decision perceptually within 4.5 seconds and that's all I got to communicate 
Now, it's my responsibility since I'm putting the strokes down in order. What is it I want to say? And uh, what I believe needs to be said? Or what can I contribute in order to start the conversation? I didn't want to leave it to someone else. That's the reason why I like it. Yeah. That's, I think it's more, that's just where I come from. It on. Yeah. So you, if you know that you have that 4.5 seconds, that's yeah. why you put all the planning and the strategy and you're meticulous in the way that you approach it because you want to kind of maximize that opportunity. If I'm the one who's implementing the, or rather it's uh, starting the conversation. I mean, I mean, wouldn't you think about what it is you want to say to me before you uh, got it or just left it up to me? <laughs> Always. I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I look at it as far as just you're asking questions and you're like presenting something for someone to think about, to respond. And uh, the question, and then give the opportunity for the question to go, or rather the conversation to enlarge itself somewhere else in proximity. Well, that, and that is always kind of the balance is you can plan and strategize for that 4.5 seconds and then you have to have that openness for for the other side, you know, and see and where it goes because communication sometimes heads down paths that you can't really plan for. I like the word instead of openness, I like to say invitation. That's a good word. So you're inviting people to continue inviting, the conversation. You're inviting people to engage. Yeah, that's important work. Exactly. It's a responsibility. I mean, not not to get too philosophical about that, but yeah. I, I, I would suggest that one of the things that we really could use more of is that opportunity to engage. I, I think it's the most powerful tool we have. I mean, as an artist, I think it's the most powerful tool we have. We have the power to engage. And the question is, what do we do with it? What have you seen your art? What have you seen your art kind of create as far as that engagement is concerned? Opportunities to talk, converse about the subject matter. Converse with people, yeah. Just opportunities to expand in a large conversation. Yeah, get a chance for people to learn you. You get a chance to learn them and, uh, and share. Yeah, it's been great. Well, you're here. Yeah, I never imagined being in, 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 in this part of Maine before. <laughs> yes, Little John Island, Greater Portland. Yeah, exactly. You probably don't even, you're quite know exactly where you are with this rapid turnaround, right? I, I, I. <laughs> it's just, this is really a wonderful, wonderful trip. This is just wonderful to me. Yeah, absolutely. I never even heard of Little John Allen until, until Emma told me, oh, we're crossing the causeway going to Little John Allen. And I turned back to Kevin like, I, we're, 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 we're doing well. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I mean, we're, we're two islands out into the ocean at this point. You've gone over a bridge. You've gone over a causeway. Yeah. We have boats going yeah. by on a regular basis. Yeah. In case in point, as far as with your, yeah, the question, I never imagined that, yeah, that we'd be sitting here. And, uh, and having the opportunity to be able to... Um, people get the opportunity to get to know me as far as way up what I believe and um, being able to engage with me you know, through this platform is there anything that I haven't asked you that you think people would be interested to know about you I have no idea you know I you know I no I have no idea um, I think the most important things is that you know it's um, regarding as far as the art and what I do, what I do. And that I look forward to more opportunities to be able to uh, maybe I'll even meet some of these people who are viewing this or listening to this. And um, it may spur some other conversations. And I think that's really the whole... Hmm. You know, you know something, and I'm going to say this, 
is that a colleague of mine, he, he recently brought this up to me. He says, you know, Rod, um, I'm really looking at being a quote unquote professional artist differently. And um, he says, I am. Um, a friend of his sent him something on Instagram and it had to do with serving. What way does this serve other people? I mean, we're so used to making a name for ourselves. We're so used to trying to make money or to be so, uh, how, you know, to validate or qualify that we are a professional, quote unquote, as opposed to a servant, as opposed to someone that's trying to, and whatever that, you know, trying to provide something. And, um, so, you know, I, I thought about that and I, I said, um, you know, I was talking over Kim. I said, you know something? I used to be very, very ardent about, okay, I want to be a full-time painter or rather a self-supporting painter. That's what it is. And, um, and now I'm not that, now I'm okay with being a painter that's supported by me working a full-time job. And whatever way it, it takes, I mean, yeah, that's, that's not the objective. But really, how does it serve somebody else? And uh, what does it do for them? And I know we use so many words as far as inspire, or, you know, and that means different things to different people. But, um, but really, what benefit do they get? So it really challenged my thinking about why I'm doing this. I'm not saying that it wasn't leaning that direction, you know, as far as, you know, to expose something that's you now to engage or to bring up a subject matter that uh, not normally talk about, you know, people of color and uh, representationalism, but um, how they can benefit and how, you know, what does that look like for me as far as to, uh, to serve? And I'm like, oh, maybe this is one of those ways. It's interesting how that unfolded for you. What do you mean? Well, it wasn't necessarily what you thought you were getting into this for, but over time, you were exposed to that possibility. Isn't that what maturity is? I think so. Well, thank goodness I'm maturing. I, I hope so. <laughs> well, it, it beats the alternative. Yeah. 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 Immaturity. Or just staying stuck. Now, yeah, I wish I had the opportunity to interview you. <laughs> what do you mean by stuck? <laughs> well, I think that the, uh, I, I, my sense is that there are people for whom um, a certain stage is reached in their lives mm. and they keep kind of circling mm. around that stage no matter how much longer they walk the planet. They just kind of hang out in that stage indefinitely. And I think that that, for me, is always the hardest thing to understand because I'm like you think that we're all kind of continually in evolution. Something about staying stuck in a stage is, um, seems like it would be challenging. I don't know why, why the word living keeps coming to mind when you were talking. It's almost like you stop living. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I think that's the only thing that just did that I wanted to it just came to mind about for other people to know, or I guess about me or my perspective, delegated to my perspective or what as an artist. Well, I do hope people will, um, I guess we'll say respond to your invitation. I hope so too. You know, we, um, I mean, you, you watch the news. And we're in a society, and especially over the past 24 months, where uh, not many invitations are given. So I hope so, too. Well, I appreciate you responding to our invitation to come here today. We wouldn't have missed it, and she wouldn't have missed it, wherever she is out on the island right now, so she wouldn't have missed it. You're talking about Kim now. I'm talking about, I'm talking about Kim. Yeah. Thank you for bringing her along.
Oh, oh, she. I wouldn't have had it any other way. We, um, I wouldn't have had it any other way. I wondered that we we're we're in this together. Well, I hope that you both have the opportunity to enjoy really what's a wonderful day here in Maine, or at least worth a trip back. Yes. We'll see how. how well, yeah. You know, hopefully, my negotiations will go well with that. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Well, we're trying to make it as easy as possible here with the wonderful weather that is being provided Absolutely. to move those negotiations forward in a positive direction <laughs> for you. Well, put in a good word, Lisa. Um, you know, you can like nudge or whatnot, please, and just don't just leave my name out of okay. it. Okay. You know. <laughs> okay. I'll do it in a very subtle way. Very good. Well, I very much appreciate having the chance to talk with you today. Thank you. Thank you for the invite. And, uh, and the opportunity, you know, you know, it's not really, it's not, it's not, it's not really something that uh, some of the things I just, you know, talk about freely anyway. So I think, you know, glad that we had the opportunity to put it, put it out on this forum. I've been speaking with Portland Art Gallery artist Rodney Dennis, and I hope that you will accept his invitation to engage, as I think that you'll find um, he's a fascinating individual. There's a lot there. So take the time to learn more about his art through the Portland Art Gallery. And um, at some point, maybe he'll come back to Maine and be part of one of our in-person artist openings and, and you can meet him in person. Thank you for coming today. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. <laughs>